So the function I will use is a monomial for now. Um, and that monomial is just the toric monomial which vanishes to order one on each toric divisor. So if you're into toric geometry, you know how to decode this exponent vector as an actual monomial on this toric variety. If not, it's just, you know, it's the monomial that vanishes to a single order on every coordinate hyperplane that you can think of in one. So this is, the claim is this will be the mirror to a hypersurface in k star to the n. If you compactify to a toric variety v, then the claim is you should be adding extra terms to this w, and there will be one extra term for each stratum of compactification that you put in v compared to c star to the n. Okay. So this is in need of examples. Um, and besides, you don't need to know this definition. You can just play with the examples afterwards. So first example, let's just look at the pair of pants, which is the hypersurface defined by the equation one plus x1 plus x2 equals zero inside C star squared or rather K star squared. Um, and, you know, so this is, you know, if you take just the line x1 plus x2 equals minus one in the plane and you delete the two points where it intersects the coordinate axis, then, um, then you get, well, a usual pair of pants. Okay. So if we apply this construction, well, the corresponding piecewise linear function will be the max of one is just, you know, the monomial with exponent zero. So it goes to zero c1 and c2. Take the max of that. I've tried to draw what this function looks like. It's zero in the bottom left quadrant and it's c1 and c2 over two other triangular regions. So now you have to use your space visualization abilities and imagine the part of three-dimensional space that lives above the graph of this function. And what you will see is, well, this is like a wedge of space that doesn't look like a usual octant, but it's congruent to it under a linear transformation. So toric geometry tells us that in fact, this is an unusual way of describing the moment polytope just of C cubed. And now the function defined by the vector that points straight up um, so vanishing to order one on each coordinate plane is just the coordinate, the product of the coordinates. So this is the mirror of the pair of pants. Next part was that if we compactify, so for example, how can I compactify this? Well, I can think of this as being the affine part of a homogeneous equation defining a line in P2. Right? I just started with a line and I intersected it with C star squared in the beginning, but now I look at it in projective space instead. So I just compactified by adding back those three points. And the recipe which I didn't give you says that I should be adding three different monomials on top of my W zero to produce the mirror to that. And there will be a parameter T, which in some sense is the Novikov parameter on the other side. Um, anyway, you should think of it as a numerical parameter that is small for our purposes. Okay. And people who have seen before mirror symmetry for the two sphere will say this is way more complicated than what they remember. And that's correct. That's because it comes out of a more complicated construction. All right, so there's already some lessons to be drawn from this because, you know, rather than these formulas which are impossible to learn on the spot, I would like to rather draw your attention to the following things. So what's a toric variety? A toric variety is a compactification of a C star to the N plus one. So this mirror space, I should imagine that it has the main C star to the N plus one and then it has strata added to it. And in fact, the levels of this function W0. 
most of them, if I set it to be non-zero, then that gets me you know, into the open stratum of Y, and most of these level sets will be just C star to be N's. So if you look at C cubed and you set Z1, Z2, Z3 equals a non-zero constant, you get C star squared. And what we will see pretty soon is that this C star to be N is mirror to the ambient C star to be N, or maybe I should have said K star to be N, containing my hypersurface H. And if you know toric mirror symmetry, then you might know that the mirror to a toric variety V of dimension N is in fact C star to the N equipped with a poly, uh, polynomial, which is exactly this WV that I'm adding. So the slogan is going to be that the fibers of W0 are in fact mirrors to the ambient space for my hypersurface H. Of course, this is all empty words right now because I'm not proving any mirror symmetry statements. The zero fiber of W0 on the other hand, so if you look again at this example, this is just Z1, Z2, Z3 equals zero. It's the union of the coordinate planes in C cubed. In general, it's a union of toric varieties, one for each term in F. If I have three terms in my Laurent polynomial, that's why I have three coordinate hyperplanes in the mirror. And these intersect along, of course, the lower dimensional toric strata of Y. And these lower dimensional strata are exactly the critical locus of W0 as a function. Okay, is this example reasonably clear or are there questions? complete silence. Um, I will go on, but feel free to type something in the chat if you actually have a question at this point. All right. So next example, just so that we have more to talk about, I can define, for example, a free punctured elliptic curve as a hypersurface in C star squared or in another k star squared. Um, and now the parameter t makes its appearance. It dictates as, as t goes to zero, in fact, the scale of these things in the complex plane gets larger and larger. This is like a tropical limit for a family of complex curves. Or again, it's a single curve defined over the Novikov field. So our construction now says, okay, you will look at the max of zero, x1, x2, minus one, minus x1, minus x2. And then you'll do the construction again, you'll have a max of four terms. Now you have to imagine this function on the plane and you look at what lives above its graph. And that, you know, now you use your toric geometry intuition. You see that there's a CP2 in here and that in fact the whole thing is the total space of a line bundle over it. It's the total space of O of minus three over CP2. And then W0 is minus U Z0, Z1, Z2. Renato asks, why does W0 come with a negative sign? One answer is we don't care very much for this talk, but for the other side of mirror symmetry, well actually anyway, there's, it's just what comes out of the enumerative geometry that produces these mirrors. And the minus sign will come in slightly handy at some point in the near future. It's just what comes up. Anyway, don't, don't obsess over the negative sign. All right. So now if I compactify this elliptic curve to something, you know, a closed two torus inside some toric variety, then I can do that and it will be the same space, a line bundle over CP2, but now with a more complicated function. And this function, see the U factors out. So it's, it's U times something else, but something else is a homogeneous polynomial of degree three, which defines for T non-zero, a smooth cubic elliptic curve in CP2. 
And that elliptic curve is the usual mirror to this elliptic curve. So in most of the talk, because we are working with this general construction, we don't know in advance that we might have these simplifications. But later on, I will want to return to this example and ask when can we find mirrors that are actually curves rather than these free folds with functions. So the fastest way to prove mirror symmetry is to work with a free fold. But the one that you would like to do, of course, is to go back to one dimensional geometry because after all, we feel that the mirror of a one dimensional thing should be a one dimensional thing. All right. But to dash those hopes, what's going on here? There's a lot of weird stuff on my screen. Doesn't come off. Uh, is Zoom playing tricks on me? I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, all right, so next example. Let's look at a curve of higher genus inside some toric surface. So then the procedure will again give you a three dimensional toric variety, Y, with some function. And the claim is that the critical locus of this function will actually be a union of CP1s meeting in nodes. So here we had examples that were slightly simpler, but the claim is in general the critical locus of the superpotential will be some funny configuration. If I take a smooth genus two curve, I will have something whose critical locus is a union of three spheres intersecting in two triple points. And what I should imagine is that near each triple point, this looks like you know, the function z1, z2, z3 on c cubed. But this, you know, you know this, this sits inside a bigger toric variety. So in fact, well, I, you know, I can't resist showing you, uh, you know, basically Jeff Koons has been making sculptures that were kind of you know, explained pretty well what does the mirror of a curve look like. Uh, with a slight problem that his, well, he did not know about the rule that the vertices had to be trivalent, but um, anyway, let's just pretend that this is like, a, you know, there's only three components meeting at each node. All right, so now, now we're going to get into Fouquet categories of these things, but yes, good time for questions. Oh, I have a purple one. Oh, wow, Joe, uh, we need to share your screen. That's amazing. <laughs> this is a Christmas present this year. They're pretty cool. Amazing. Okay. All right. Um, so, Okay, so now we need to talk a bit about how we associate a Foucault category to such a space, because that's what we will need in order to prove mirror symmetry. So the first thing I want to say is the way that, you know, there's various ways to try to associate a Foucault category to a total space equipped with a complex valued function. And the first and best known example is if we have something that would have, say, isolated non-degenerate critical points, because that thing then becomes a Lefschetz vibration. And then Paul Seidel has been developing for the past 20 years the right way to do Fleur theory inside Lefschetz vibrations. Um, and that would also work in the proper case, but now we want to allow for some slightly more scary possibility that our Lagrangians inside Y will be fiber-wise non-compact. And so then we need some slightly more general constructions. So another remark, which for me is mostly conjectural because I don't really understand what I'm about to say, is that 
a space with a function should determine a sector. If y were an exact Taylor manifold, so it's a Stein manifold, then in fact we would have a Weinstein sector in the sense of Gana trois pardon Schende by marking inside the contact boundary of y at infinity basically the part of the boundary where w goes to say minus infinity and in some sense we should be thinking of the wrap Foucault category of a non-exact sector defined in a similar way by removing the part or marking as a stop the part of y where w goes to minus infinity because I don't know how to define this technically and because we started working on this before sectors were invented uh, I will instead use something different a more ad hoc construction for our setup which is called monomial admissibility and was studied in depth in Andrew Hanlon's thesis so the objects of the category in any case are properly embedded Lagrangians with extra data like spin structures grading and so on um, which I will assume they don't bound any holomorphic disks and the other thing is um, they should be monomially admissible so monomially admissible of course is the part that you're not familiar with oh interesting Tom says that somebody is drawing on my screen. That's maybe why I have like little specks of dust. I mean, I'm also drawing on my own screen, but okay. Uh, all right, so monomial admissibility requires several things. So we will focus on W0 first, and we can ask, we project Y down to the complex plane by this function W0, and in the, you know, inside a bounded subset, anything can happen. But we ask that outside of a bounded subset, our Lagrangians only go to infinity along radial arcs that are moreover in the right half plane. That doesn't matter so much. Mostly we need to avoid some angular sector towards minus infinity. Um, and, okay. So this may be reminiscent for those of you who know Foucault's idol categories of the way that Lefschetz fimbles in Lefschetz vibrations project over arcs that go to infinity to one side. The other condition is a bit harder to state, but it's worth spending some time. It's what we need basically to enforce maximum principles. And so maybe I should have stopped, you know, gone back a bit, sorry. So why is it useful to have Lagrangians which project to unions of arcs for Fleur theory? It's because now if I look at a holomorphic disk up here in Y and I project it down to the base, well, the maximum principle tells me it can do stuff inside this compact region where I don't know what's happening, but outside there, the only way that a holomorphic disk can exist with boundaries, sorry, if a projection is holomorphic, which it is, um, holomorphic disks have to be contained inside the fibers. Or, you know, if I have several Lagrangians over arcs and paths that are going in different directions at infinity, then I can, you know, I can socially distance my generators, well, maybe not, okay. Anyway, I can keep my Fleur trajectories inside well-defined polygonal regions of the base. So now we want to do the same thing in the fiber as well. And for that, the trick of monomial admissibility is to remember that each fiber of W0 is in fact a C star to the N. And so I can talk about uh, coordinates on that. And outside of a compact subset, of C star to the N, I will decompose C star to the N into a union of regions. And for each region, there will be some monomial in the coordinates of this C star to the N. And I will require that this monomial 
is locally constant. So this sounds like complicated and hard to understand. Um, it will be clearer in an example. What I mean, for example, is, you know, if y is, say, c cubed, and I'm looking at this z1, z2, z3, what I might do there is where one of the coordinates zi is larger than the others, I will actually require that, say, zi is real positive. So this sort of thing allows me to apply further maximum principles in those regions of the fiber to each of these monomials, and that will give me control over floor trajectories. So secretly what this is doing is this is also allowing for the possibility of stops inside the fiber direction of W0. Because after all, I'm interested in putting stops not just where W0 goes to real minus infinity, which I've kind of done with this requirement here that I go to infinity in certain ways for W0, but I also want to do it for the monomials in this W sub V. If I'm just looking at a mirror of something in C star to the N, then this is a technical requirement. But if it's a mirror of something in the toric variety, then this plays a part in mirror symmetry. Okay. So one truth in advertising statement is that for there to exist any Lagrangian satisfying, interesting Lagrangian satisfying this condition, we need to use an unusual toric Kähler form on Y because we need the arguments of these various functions to Poisson commute in the regions where the arguments are being controlled. Otherwise, there's no way that you can have a Lagrangian that simultaneously projects to an arc for two different projections at once. But in fact, there exists such Kähler forms. Okay, so, and we'll do examples. Okay, I'm just like throwing the theory at you to bother you. Um, so, all right. We have these non-compact Lagrangians. We need to define perturbations that will push them in appropriate ways before we take intersections to do Fleur theory. And so we'll have a flow which takes an admissible Lagrangian L to some other admissible Lagrangian L sub T. So remember, admissibility says the argument of W0 and the argument of this extra monomial Z to the nu are controlled at infinity. And what we will do is we will just take a flow which still has things admissible, but increases the values of these monomials, you know, rotates each of these monomials at infinity. And when we want to put a stop, so in particular for W0, but also for any extra monomials which appear in this potential W, I will have the flow increase the argument of these monomials only inside a bounded interval that's strictly contained in minus pi pi. So I do not want to wrap in those directions. I will actually put a stop on my manifold in the directions at infinity where the arguments of any of these variables becomes pi, where they become real negative. And for the other monomials, which were there just for technical purposes, I actually wrap. I want to increase the argument of these variables all the way to infinity. Okay, so we'll see this in action on examples. And then once this is done, well, I will define morphisms between two admissible Lagrangians to be a direct limit as I increase the amount of perturbation of the Fleur complexes between a perturbed version of L0 and L1. 
uh, but there are climates under natural continuation maps that exist for the kinds of Hamiltonians that affect these perturbations. Okay, and again, uh, the monomial admissibility condition ensures that there's no technical issues with compactness and so on. Okay. All right, so I think an example is in order because otherwise there's just no way you can follow. So here's what I meant in the previous slide. So let's do an example. Let's do C cubed with minus Z1, Z2, Z3. That's the mirror of a pair of pants. What I want to do is define a Lagrangian by taking, so I start with a Lagrangian inside a fiber of W0. It says right C cubed projecting by W0 to the complex plane. And I want to start from a Lagrangian inside a fiber of this map and then transport it over an arc in the base in order to produce a Lagrangian the total space. So what we would want to do based on the idea of Leffert's vibrations is maybe start at the critical value zero and project transport along an arc. You can do this to produce, oh, sorry, uh, there was a question which I missed from Hero. Because I'm working over a Novikov field, can the direct limit definition be equivalent to a hum in the continuation map localization? Yes, what I mean is really we localize with respect to the continuation maps. And I think this is the, the correct technical statement is the category is defined by localizing at the continuation maps. Okay. So back to this example. Um, so what I would do for a left vibration would be start from a critical point and build a Lagrangian that projects to an arc out of a critical value. But here the singularities are too complicated to allow us to produce smooth Lagrangians of the sort we want in this way. And so the insight that actually allows one to calculate these Foucault categories much more efficiently is to let go of the singularities and instead focus on Lagrangians that project to other kinds of arcs, namely U-shaped arcs in the complex plane. Well, maybe V-shaped if you remember that we need the legs at infinity to be radial from the origin for technical reasons. So what we do is we start with a Lagrangian in a fiber. The fiber at minus one is my favorite one. And the reason is because of this minus sign here, the fiber at minus one is canonically the kind of C star squared in which there is a real positive part. So I know what I mean by V R plus squared inside this particular C star squared. I don't have to make choices about which coordinate is which. It's the place where all of the coordinates Z1, Z2, Z3 are real positive and their product is one. So this is something I will call little l0. And parallel transport means right, using the symplectic orthogonal to each fiber. I can identify all the smooth fibers by symplectomorphisms, and this takes my l0 to some other Lagrangians inside all of those. Of course, they all look like r plus squares inside c star squares. But if I try to think of, you know, in this plot, this is something like maybe log norms and these are arguments and you know the argument now variable gets a little bit you know bent by the monodromy um, and so now what i will need to do as i let time evolve is two things one is i move i rotate my base direction a bit okay so for large t l0t will project to a different u shape whose legs are both counterclockwise from those of L0, but it will not go all around. It kind of stays in this position. This is the final position in which things are. And meanwhile, inside the fiber, I will do wrapping in the sense of wrapped Fleur theory on C star squared, which means I push things around by a Hamiltonian, which is just a function, you know, a convex functions of the moment map coordinates. 
and that has the effect of rotating the argument variables more and more as t increases. So for each fixed value of t, the argument rotates by a finite amount, but I will take a limit as t goes to infinity. All right. And the admissibility conditions will be basically that, well, initially my L0 had the property that every variable was real positive in the fiber at minus one. Under parallel transport, I've arranged that this remains true wherever that variable is the largest or not one of the smallest. And then the wrapping will actually increase this value of the argument from zero to t or something linear in t. So now if I try to understand the wrapped Fleur theory of rather the fiber-wise wrapped Fleur theory of this Lagrangian, I have to understand what are the intersections for large t. So I have some intersections between L0 and its push-off which live in the fiber above minus one. What this looks like inside there is the wrapped Fleur cohomology, or wrapped Fleur complex of little L0 with itself. And we know that this looks like a ring of Laurent polynomials in two variables. Okay, this is like a two variable version of the fact that on a cylinder, if I take R plus in C star and I do wrapped Fleur theory, uh, I get an infinite sequence of generators and the ring structure is that of Laurent polynomials. Now, the new thing is I also have intersections in this other fiber here. And in there, it kind of looks like the same picture, even though it's been bent a bit by the monodromy of the vibration. So I get, in fact, another copy of the wrapped floor complex of L0 with itself. So Laurent polynomials again. But graded in degree minus one because of rotation in the base direction. And now we can ask about floor differentials. Well, using the open mapping principle for projection, you know that Fleur trajectories either have to stay inside the fiber, so we would have a Fleur differential on these complexes themselves. In this case, it vanishes. And we can also have Fleur trajectories which project to this region in the base. So that means they are now going to be strips in C cubed with these boundary conditions and their sections over the central region. So they have to pass somewhere in the central fiber. And in fact, they have to pass in one of the three components, in one of the three coordinate planes. They can't pass anywhere else because then the intersection multiplicity with the central fiber would be more than one. And it turns out in fact, that if you pick an input generator here, then there are exactly three Fleur strips, one for each, component of a central fiber. And if you keep track of your, you know, if you do proper accounting, you will find that the Fleur differential thought of as a map from Laurent polynomials to Laurent polynomials is multiplication by one plus X one plus X two. So why is that interesting? That's because this is exactly what we wanted. What we wanted was well, okay, so the outcome is that the cohomology of endomorphism, so the wrapped Fleur homology of L0 is going to be a quotient of Laurent polynomials by the ideal generated by one plus X1 plus X2, right? This map, this, this Fleur differential is injective. So all this dies in cohomology and the co-kernel over here is the quotient of Laurent polynomials by this idea. And the good news is this is, first of all, one piece of good news is this is actually a ring isomorphism. You can calculate the product structure by counting triangles on three different copies of L0. Uh, there's also no higher product because, well, it's an algebra concentrated in degree zero, so there's no room for messy products. And this is exactly the same as the ring of functions of the mirror, which was defined by the equation one plus x one plus x two equals zero inside k star squared. Take the ring of regular functions, and when you restrict to a hypersurface, that amounts to quotienting by the ideal 
generated by its defining equation. Okay. So there's a similar calculation for any hypersurface, in fact. It works just the same. You get the quotient of Laurent polynomials by, well, what you get now instead of one plus x one plus x two will be one term for each component of the central fiber. And remember, I've told you these are in correspondence with the monomials in F. And so if you have set things up properly, you will get exactly the ring of functions of your hypersurface. So checking that the endomorphisms of L0 and those of a structure sheaf of a mirror match is all you need to get homological mirror symmetry for affine hypersurfaces, I mean hyperspaces in sister to the N, as long as you know that this L0 generates the fiberwise wrap to K a category. We know this for the pair of pants. Um, I personally do not feel confident in claiming that we know this in the general case. So that if is you know, still unresolved as far as I can tell. I mean, in this example, in the pair of pants example, it's fine. Yes. All right. So the next part of the example, sorry, first, any questions? We're going to revisit this in a moment, but um, I guess should pause a minute for questions and then we'll move on to the same thing, but the mirror now of the same equation defining a line inside CP2. Okay, so next thing I want to do is redo this calculation. But now for the mirror of the compactification of my pair of pants inside P2. And remember what I said is this would add these extra terms called WB. And so the change is that we will not wrap fiber wise. We will only increase the arguments of these variables, Z1, Z2, and Z3 slightly at infinity. So I can restart with the same thing. Okay, I'm going to just first redo the same picture. Uh, one thing that will change is that I will not wrap. However, if I only do that, then L0 is not enough of, you know, to consider. And the reason is, well, after all, if I want to do geometry on some, you know, this like compact curve, right? this P1 inside P2, just looking at global functions is not going to get me very far. Projective varieties don't have very much in the way. Oh, sorry, question from Danny. Generation does not follow from structural generation for Weinstein manifolds. So that's a very good question. For the pair of pants, it does, but in example, in pretty much any example other than this one will not be exact. Okay, so the, the problem here is I don't want to assume that Y is a Weinstein manifold because outside of pairs of pants, it will not be. But conceptually, yeah, we don't expect any major surprises. Um, you know, that's why it's very believable, but I can't, I don't think that out, outside of the case of pairs of pants, I don't think it's known. For pairs of pants, yes, that's, the, that's one way to state the result. Okay, so, all right, so now we need more objects because basically we can't do, you know, interesting algebraic geometry on P1 just by looking at the ring of uh, adjusted functions. We need other line bundles. So first I need to tell you about how line bundles work in mirror symmetry for toric varieties. So what happens here is now if I look again at the fibers of W0, they are still going to be C star squared. I'm still using W0 as my projection to do anything, okay? But each fiber of this will now carry this extra W sub B. And what this W sub B looks like, once I remember that Z1, Z2, Z3 is a constant C, is Z1 plus Z2 plus constant over Z1, Z2. And uh, people in the know know that this is exactly how you express the mirror to P2 in toric mirror symmetry. So we know how to find Lagrangians in C star squared, which are admissible for WV, 
which match with given sheaves, or in our case, line bundles on P2. This kind of started out seriously with Mohammed Abu Zaid's thesis, so the version here is more like Andrew Hanlon's version for the monomial admissibility, but it's really the same construction. So what we do is we start from a Lagrangian L sub K inside C star squared, which is built as a section of a log map. So the arguments of the variables are given by functions of the log norms of the variables. And L zero from before was just the zero section, argument equals zero everywhere. But now what we'll do instead is we'll let the arguments twist by multiples of two pi so that they're still zero at infinity across this picture, um, which is actually the picture that I've had all along for like what, you know, how I think of my degeneration to a union of C squares. So I should imagine that as I cross the Z2 axis, so when Z2 is large and Z1 goes from small to large, its argument will go from zero to negative two pi k, while argument Z2 remains zero so that admissibility is preserved. Conversely, as I go over the Z1 axis, so as Z2 increases while Z1 is large, argument Z2 decreases by two pi k, and something similar in terms of Z3 on the third case. So there's explicit formulas that I don't want to bother you with, but you can define Lagrangians explicitly that look like this. And these are known to be mirrors to line bundles O of K on P2. So in particular, the Fleur cohomology inside this C star squared of L0 with LK matches the cohomology. So it means say the sections of the cohomology of O of K on P2. So now what we want to do is take these LKs and upgrade them to Lagrangians in C cubed. Again, by parallel transport along a U-shaped arc. So we start in the fiber at minus one again with L0 and LK. And what I've tried to picture here is that LK twists K times around the argument direction. So this is maybe like K equals two factorially, something like that. Of course, I'm missing some dimensions. And now, as before, after parallel transport and perturbation, ah, so now my perturbations are not going to wrap things in the fiber because I've declared no more wrapping for me, I'm done. And that's the role of this WV in the potential. So once I'm here, the picture looks again similar, except now I need to be a bit more careful about what the monodromy does. And it turns out that the monodromy of this map Z1, Z2, Z3 around the origin is exactly this kind of twisting in the argument torus that takes L0 to L1 or LK to LK plus one or things like that. And so what's noteworthy is that the images of L0 and LK under the monodromy, once you redraw this fiber suitably, look like L0 and LK minus one. So the slogan here is the monodromy of W0 around the origin is mirror to tensoring by O of one. And in general, it would be tensoring by the line bundle that defines my hypersurface H. So once I know this, I can again calculate my Fleur cohomology by writing the Fleur complex, which involves Fleur complexes in these two fibers and a connecting differential. And the connecting differential again counts holomorphic sections over this region. There's again the same three terms, really the geometry hasn't changed much. This is just like a non-wrapped version of the previous picture. And so here this will be multiplication by the defining equation of H and that's a general fact. And now that what has changed is multiplication by the defining equation is no longer just a function, it's a section so of course it can't go between the same spaces. So in fact, this is best expressed in terms of what happens, um, you know, the final answer for the degree zero part of the cohomology ends up being that I look at sections of O of K on P2. I think here I'm assuming that K is non-negative or something. And I quotient it 
by the ideal generated by x0 plus x1 plus x2, which is exactly how I study sections of the restriction of O of k to this hypersurface H. And so in general, I can match U-shaped Lagrangians in this way with restrictions of line bundles on V to the hypersurface H. And so this gives me homological mirror symmetry mode generation. Okay, so given the evolution of the time coordinate of this talk, there will not be a second half of the talk and instead I will dig further into the first half. So the claim is that there are functors relating the Foucault categories of the total space and the fiber. Uh, there's functors called cap and cup, which go from the fiber to the total space and backwards. These were first understood by Abu Zaid and Ganatra and by Zach Selvan. Um, so the cup functor, what it does is it goes from the fiber of W0 to the total space. It takes a Lagrangian in the fiber, which is admissible fiber-wise for WV, and it transports it over a U-shape. So cup L is something that looks like this in the base of W0. Cap L does backwards kind of, it's the adjoint to this functor in fact. It looks at a Lagrangian in the total space Y. And remember it has to fiber over arcs under W0 at infinity. And we just look at the collection of its ends. Now if there's only one end that gives you one object in the Foucault category of the fiber, if you have several ends, then actually you get a twisted complex with some connecting differentials. And this is maybe not unrelated to you know, the kinds of construction that Beer and Cornea get out of the ends of cobordisms. Now we have a singular vibration, but this is very similar conceptually. So now these functors fit in fact in an exact triangle, sorry, with one more. There's also another functor acting on the category of the fiber, which is just the monodromy of the vibration W0 around the origin. So the observation is that the ends of cup L are, well, there's L itself, but as you push around the fiber, here I've gone clockwise, so I get the image of L under the inverse of the monodromy, which means that cap cup L is built out of, it's a twisted complex built from L and mu inverse of L. And in more functorial language, I have an exact triangle of functors. And there's a natural transformation which comes up as the connecting map in here. And that connecting map is counting holomorphic sections over this kind of U shape. So this is actually something that Seidel had probably been the first one to notice, that there's a lot of advantages to thinking about section counting over disks surrounding a, a singular fiber of a vibration as a natural transformation from the monodromy to identity or vice versa. So given a Lagrangian little l, you draw this picture and you count holomorphic sections of W0 over this disk shape with one output here. And that gives you an element of a Fleur complex of um, mu inverse l with l. If you had multiple, in, remember this is just the leading term of an A infinity natural transformation. So there's more terms with bigger polygons and more inputs, but let's not worry about that. So in this language, what we've calculated when we said U-shaped Lagrangians, their intersections look like two things happening in the fiber and the connecting differential, which counts sections, was in fact saying that if we take two U-shaped Lagrangians, so there's an adjunction which says we can do this in the fiber. And because this functor is the cone of this here, we can actually reduce to looking at homes in the fiber, but also looking at homes in the fiber with a monodromic twist and a connecting differential. And the point is that this matches with mirror symmetry on the mirror side. 
um, if I have a hypersurface H in a variety V, I have inclusion and restriction functors. I have an adjunction between them. And the calculation for Holmes in the Dirac theory of H between restrictions of things from V is similarly governed by the same principle. And so this gives us a result that we have in fact a commutative diagram of mirror symmetry equivalences between these inclusion restriction functors for a toric variety and a hypersurface inside it on one side and the fiber and the total space of W0 on the other side. All right. So I think it's now time for me to end the talk here and take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Denis. We're doing our best to upload, but it's a bit, it doesn't go through, through so well, applause, sometimes. So uh, any questions? Um, Uh, so I have a little uh, question maybe. So um, uh, in these correspondences, is there a way to keep track of the areas of the various um, holomorphic objects that show up? Yes. Because and so I mean, you, can't, you, you can't quite see it in this example. So let me... Okay, so the question is, how do we keep track of areas and so on, okay? So let me try to go to a blank page and tell you a little story about the next thing. The next example would be, you know, after the pair of pants, would be something like this. I would take something that's defined by, say, 1 plus x1 plus x2 plus t x1 x2, unless it's t inverse, I can't remember, can't think right now inside C star squared, the mirror of that would be something like, I mean, actually it doesn't matter. You can take any example that has powers of T in it. So the point is if I have this T here and I chose T to the one, but I could choose a different power of T, then the mirror here in this case will be, well, this is the total space of O of minus one plus O of minus one over P one. I don't know why I took this one, sorry. I had another better example before, which was the pre-punctured electric curve and its mirror was you know, line bundle over P2. Doesn't really matter which one. So the point is that P2 now has an intrinsic area, mm. right? And same thing here, that P1 has an area mm. and the area is related to the power of T that was here. Mm -hmm. So in general, if I had something much more complicated with several, you know, so many terms that I have all sorts of powers of T that come up, I can vary all these powers of T relative to each other. And that amounts to varying the Kähler parameters of a mirror. These two examples only have one. Okay. Um, and so by the way, these, uh, yeah. And so what happens then is if I, you know, if I play these kinds of games where I have Lagrangians living over yeah. U-shaped, which are now R plus squares and so on, what I will find is that there's, you know, in this example, there's four classes of holomorphic disks mm -hmm. between things, and their areas will depend, you know, the different homotopy classes of strips will have different areas, and the differences in areas will be basically, uh, you know, related to this variable t. So t now comes up really as the Novikov variable. You know, I want to count areas with Novikov parameter t. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm supposed to land back in this world. So now truth in advertising, there's a lie in what I'm telling you, which is that the constant term has to be changed by adding extra powers of t. <coughs> There's a complicated power series in T, which is some local gram of written theory of this P1 inside here that is supposed to show up to correct things in that, wait, mm, I think not in this one, sorry, I meant in that one. 
in that one there's a there's a change in the constant term and that's because my holomorphic sections you know, i've been lying to you saying oh it's easy it's holomorphic sections my holomorphic sections the ones that pass through this component the p2 i can attach to them any sphere or multiple cover of sphere inside that p2 mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a you know there's a slight regularity problem. It's not that nasty because it's the Calabria world, so there's easy techniques. You don't need polyfolds or anything fancy for dealing with that. But the net effect is that there's actually correction factors which are power series in T with some enumerative interpretation. Anyway, but so the choice of Kähler areas here affects the powers of t that show up on the other side in the obvious way because of you know, counting over Novikov fields. Okay. And then, then this will show up in the functors when you look at the floor homologies with coefficients in this, in this t stuff and on the other side in the maybe the, the ship, I mean the, the other side too, right? Oh, yes, yes, the other side too. So that's why I had a big T in my W sub V. Uh, somewhere I had a... No, it's, uh, my example for um, W sub V had this T. This big T is a Novikov parameter from the symplectic area of the torus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now there's a lot of questions. Let's see. So from Danny again, can you give the simplest example where you don't know generation? So I should say I have not tried hard to prove generation because I did not believe I could do it and because priority would be to finish writing up the result that we know already. Uh, right now, I don't know generation on any example where the total space is not subcritical. Sorry, is not... Um, well, first of all, if it's not exact, I'm not all that sure that I know how to proceed. But what is more of a concern yet is if the, I mean, I don't know any reason in general why the wrapped Fouquet category of Y with no potential should be zero. I think there's also a question by Andrew about this. If I define some fully wrapped category of Y, is there any, reason, any easy reason why it should be zero? So I believe that I know it should be zero for the you know, C to the N because that's a subcritical Weinstein domain. And I also believe it should be zero for this example of O of minus one plus O of minus one over P one because somehow the dimension, you know, this, I mean, I don't even want to say skeleton, but its topology lives all in dimension less than half. So I think the wrapped category of this would be zero. I honestly have no idea for there's maybe people in the audience who know whether say the wrapped Fouquet category of a total space of O of minus three over P2 should be trivial or not. I haven't thought about it, but I don't expect it to be automatically zero. Uh, question from Marco Gualtieri. If I am the compactified stopped case, so that there's a finite amount of wrapping. Can I comment on the relation to the infinitesimally wrapped version of Nadler as law? Of course, it's not exact, but nonetheless. So I think the answer is both Nadler as law and what I want to do are special cases of Fouquet categories of manifolds with stops. So if I have a manifold with a stop, which means there are two kinds of ends to it. There's a contact type boundary where I want to imagine maybe I have a simplectization and my Lagrangians can go to infinity. And I have a part that I would think of as a boundary, rather, that I've cut off of a stop. Then there's a duality between two kinds of Fleur theory. So if I have, you know, maybe the simplest example to think of is take a disk relative to three subsectors. So this is a three, three stops. So this is like maybe, you know, a picture of it's a Rorschach test, actually. You can decide which one you want to think of as the stop and which one is not the stop. Uh, so the point is, you know, this is like one of the simplest baby examples of playing with sectors. In this, you can look at Lagrangians, which escape to the contact boundary, which I think of as these ones, and you wrap. So you have some rape flow, but the rape flow doesn't go through the stops. So you declare that these are the stops here. And you instead have a version of Fleur theory for 
compact Lagrangians which go to the stops and you only, sorry, go close to the stops rather and you push them a little bit towards the stops. So one of them is infinitesimally wrapped, one is fully wrapped and there's dualities between them which are best understood in the case of wrapped category of a fiber, you know, if you have a vibration, then, I don't know what I'm saying, sorry. So let's say that I put a stop here. Then I can look at Lagrangians which go to infinity around here, or I can look at Lagrangians which go to infinity around there, and whether I want them to go to the stop or away from the stop, the outcome ends up being the same. So a principle that happens quite often in partially wrapped Fleur theory is that in fact the stop and its complement retract onto the same portion of the boundary at infinity. See here, it's, until I told you which is which, you couldn't tell which of these three intervals of the boundary was which. Uh, so I believe that Nadler's Aslow's infinitesimal Foucault category and the stuff about microlocal sheaves is one kind. And the wrapped Foucault category and wrapped microlocal sheaves are the other kind. And in most of these examples, once you have enough stops, the two are in fact equivalent. And what we're doing is because I'm a symplectic geometer and I don't understand microlocal theory and I barely understand stops and don't know, don't want to develop them for the non-exact setting, is just do this by hand in plain old Fleur theory with Hamiltonian perturbations. Okay. Um. Here, another question. Question. If you know that cap cup are adjoints, once you. Whoop. Yes, so this goes back to the adjunction. Once we know that they are adjoints, which one is easier to match with the other side? Um, in this case, the one that's easier is, I mean, in this case, this adjunction is a mechanism to prove that the category of a total space matches that of a hypersurface. So in fact, the way we match up things in HMS here is we start from knowledge about the category of the fiber. So where's my thing? So this side of the diagram is HMS for toric varieties, which has been understood for a while. And by developing this picture and understanding that the natural transformations are the same is how we end up proving that there is a relation between those two sides. I'm not sure if this answers Hero's question of which one of the two is easier to match up in HMS. Um, I think the short answer is what we do really is the calculation that I outlined there of actually taking these Lagrangians and counting sections. And a posteriori, you can reinterpret this in high tech language. Okay, uh, so, uh, oh, yes, oh. Annie. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask a very naive question. So at the, at the beginning, you were telling us that um, we, we want the mirror of, of of a curve to be a curve and not something of higher dimension, right? Yes, so this is almost like a planted question. So why? I mean, I, I, I don't have any expectations myself. Like, I don't know what, you, you know what so, I mean? Like, I mean, what is the, this yeah. Feels, this feels more justified for people who come from the old days of mirror symmetry for Calabi-Yau's because the mirror of an n-dimensional Calabi-Yau is in general an n-dimensional Calabi-Yau. And of course, in sufficiently hardcore language, one reason for that is that Calabi-Yau categories know their dimension. So a Z-graded Calabi-Yau categories know their dimension. Once you move away from the Calabi-Yau case, the Foucault category becomes only Z-mod two graded. And so in fact, mirror symmetry only knows about the dimension mod two. And so maybe one shouldn't be so worried, but that said, it's maybe like also something about like preservation of quantity of information. Uh, also, for example, there's, you know, 
the way that these mirrors actually are arrived at, I didn't want to tell you that because I would have run even more out of time, is that secretly the construction of this Y comma W <coughs> is actually not a mirror to H directly. It's built using well-known mirror procedures out of a space of dimension two more, which is a stabilization of H by adding two extra coordinates. And the point of that stabilization is that mirror symmetry constructions normally work for spaces where the first chunk class can be represented by some hypersurface, some complex hypersurface. And if you take a curve of genus more than one, well, the C1 is actually the wrong sign for that to hold. And so there's tricks to get around that. And these are the tricks that end up giving you these higher dimensional mirrors. So of course, uh, you know, you don't need to know that to play with the outcome. Um, so the point is, in these examples, you know, if you look at the elliptic curve, you get something, a mirror which is Morse bot. And the critical locus of that Morse bot thing is in fact, the usual mirror elliptic curve. And so there's a general principle, just going to show you a slide that I was not going to show just because I can, um, which is that you can try to associate a Foucault category to trivalent configurations of Riemann surfaces, which are what shows up as the critical locus of these potentials. And the punchline for the talk I didn't give is that you can actually define in a completely ad hoc way a notion of floor homology for trivalent graphs drawn on trivalent configurations of Riemann surfaces by counting trees of holomorphic polygons. And this gives you a completely acceptable way of doing mirror symmetry for curves. But I, you know, this one kind of comes from an ad hoc desire to get a one dimensional mirror at all costs rather than from well understood general principles. So I wouldn't know how to extend that one. Okay. All right, so uh, I don't know if there are any more questions. So um, it doesn't look like there are any more coming. But uh, okay, so in any case, uh, then uh, let's thank uh, Denis again for this nice, nice talk. So, uh, okay. So um, that's a little part. Uh, yes, I think it is recorded, Marco. Uh, it's 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 mostly recorded. Mostly recorded. Yeah, there was a little. I will also send notes. Where, I mean, I will put notes yeah. on my web page and and um, I'll post, as well, yeah. which do the whole extra seven slides for part two of the talk that did not. <laughs> so I'll I'll post them uh, this afternoon a bit later. And uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming and. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, all of you uh, each week. So um, basically, uh, just don't forget to come back again next week. <laughs> and uh, all right, and uh, Denny, don't forget to to uh, contact uh, Denny maybe. Okay. Um, for, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. I I um I emailed the Princeton people. They said there's about like a four week lag from you giving seminar to you getting paid. So I'm sure there's <laughs> a lag. Yeah. Four four <laughs> weeks seems very efficient. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here is one more question. Um, late question from Luis. Yes. Uh, sorry, Luis. What what do you mean by the last picture? The the uh, dog I, Sorry. Ah. Yeah, the dog thing. Yeah. Well, essentially, the, the dog is pre compactified in that what I would do on the dog is okay, so whatever. There's like lots of stuff that was about the pair of pants. Where was I going to? We don't see your screen, Danny. It's, oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I probably it's need a to truly see. late question. Uh, okay, there it's back. Uh, so, what I would do is uh, I lost something. Yeah, so I want to define Fleur theory directly on, you know, 
a union of cream and surfaces which may be pre-compactified. So I would work directly on the critical locus of W0 plus Wv. But if I don't want to do that, I can also do compactification. So the effect of compactification on the critical locus, maybe I should say, is when you have a non-compact leg, you, you kill it and you smooth the remaining thing. So the question maybe in Luis's language is, does the broad category of this thing, can I show that this matches the localization of the category of the thing that's smooth and doesn't have this extra leg with respect to this object? This is mirror to the question of how does one relate like one more puncture in your curve to one fewer puncture? Um, and the answer is it seems to work in the calculations. I don't have a good general theory. But so if the question was actually about just getting mirrors to compact cream and surfaces, the answer is, well, you can directly start with this kind of thing and you can develop Fleur theory on this union of three P1s with extra data, which you're seeing some of right now. And it gives you something that matches coherent sheaves on a genus two curve. Thank you. Um. Sorry, and, and the singularity here is, is, is it very simple because we're in such small dimension, but if we try to keep playing the same game, we'll get very complicated uh, so, singular stratifications in higher dimensions? Yeah, so the list of singularities you expect to get dimension by dimension, I don't think it's been worked out explicitly, but it's, it's kind of probably known, right? Because, I mean, you want to start from basically products of hyperplanes in C to the N and then build on that. And anyway, there's, there's probably a list. I haven't bothered thinking mm -hmm. about it much. Um, the point is, so the, you know, the proposal here basically is to do Fleur theory, you know, and just skip right ahead to this one, because I think it best explains what, what things we are going to look like. Uh, I was going to do Fleur theory for trivalent graphs drawn on these things by looking at propagating trees or polymorphic disks that are allowed to pass through the vertices. And what happens at the vertices is an evil construction that comes out of the knowledge from studying the local model of a pair of pants, but what happens in here has to reflect the algebraic geometry of a pair of pants. So in higher dimensions, I would have to you know, make guesses about what is the correct rule for you, you know, to use, knowing of course that it should reflect the algebraic geometry of a local mirror piece. So the point is this comes from a, you know, an attempt to kind of bypass completely the geometry of the three dimensional space inside which this thing lives. But that comes at a cost, which is that you can't actually project Fleur theory from the free fold to the critical locus. You have to kind of make it up as you go. At least this is what we've found so far. Can you arboreolize this? Sorry. No, I don't want to arboreolize this. No, I'm, I'm, I, I know you don't. I'm, I'm asking if no, you I, can. I, absolutely, I definitely don't. This is not Lagrangian. This is, uh, this is a complex manifold. But you said it was the Morse plot lo locus somewhere else? Yes, but it's, 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 I mean, it's, the, it's the critical locus of a complex, uh, of, a, of a holomorphic function. So, I mean, there is in some sense, maybe, you know, some sort of skeleton for this thing, which is what my trivalent graphs are trying to do, yeah. is possibly an arboreal, uh, I mean, part of the arboreal picture, but it's a very degenerate thing because it's meant to live inside a threefold instead of being just on a Riemann surface. Right, I mean, for the mirror of a pair of pants, my picture is yeah. just three Cs. Yeah, yeah. And inside that, my Lagrangian is these things. Um, what the arboreal picture would be instead, sorry, what the skeleton picture would be, would be a cone over T2 and its arborealization becomes instead, well, you kind of take the same thing, but you, you, know, you, you kind of resolve the point somehow. I don't know how to turn this picture into, I mean, this is really more like a complex geometer's picture of what's happening and not a skeleton person's picture. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Can I bother you with one more? 
sure. question. Um, so also like in this, like for just in the pair of pants case, right? You can all, if you were doing mirror symmetry like the other way, you can also like reduce it to DB co. I mean, you can do this unsymmetric thing where there's just two C's meeting at a point, right? Yeah. Is there like a Fukaya version of that too or not? Yes. Um, if you are in which of my slides that was on, you know, one of the things I had all these slides that we are going to do this um, right here. So the point is exactly for small enough examples of curves, there are mirrors which are in fact total spaces of line bundles like this one with a function that is not quite Morse bot, but nonetheless it's a variable times a function on the base. And so if the zero locus of that thing had been smooth, it was Morse bot like here. Otherwise, that thing is singular. And so the statement is now you can destabilize the mirror to get a mirror which is, well, in this case, it's a nodal a mirror of a free puncture elliptic curve is a nodal configuration of three T ones. And so the statement is for a nodal curve, you can define the Fouquet category as a quotient of a category of a smoothing by, in fact, an object which is the vanishing cycle of a degeneration. And so my student, Maxim Jeffs, is actually working on understanding to what extent this can be done more generally and equivalent to the Fouquet category of the total space inside which this thing lives. So basically you have to make up a recipe for Fouquet categories of singular hypersurfaces, but this one is slightly different from the one about, you know, what I was also alluding to about instead Fouquet categories of critical loci. And the reason is you don't interpret the space in the same way, right? This one is a singular symplectic manifold viewed as a degeneration of a family of smooth symplectic manifolds. The other one is a symplectic manifold showing up as critical locus of a function. Is there like a map from one to the other? It's not completely obvious. I mean, in, in these examples, yes, you can do it, but the problem is there's too few examples to really give a sense of what the general conceptual picture should be. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so there was another comment from uh, Yuchi Ike, but <clears throat> this is not quite a question, <clears throat> but um, it's, a, it's a referral to a paper about uh, the relation between the Rapfuka category and micro-local theory of shifts. Um, in any case, I think, um, we, I think that's, we're getting close to the time we actually have but, for this. Yes, Danny? Well, I, I, I just clicked on the link and it's something about group rotation type crowdsourcing. So it's, it's, oh. it's somewhat. Okay, so you might it, want to find another paper by you. <laughs> it's so. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, sorry, sorry. But yeah, in any case, so uh, Benny, uh, thanks again very much for the talk and for, uh, uh, and for all the interaction with the questions, everything. And uh, so I hope to see everyone uh, next week. So until um, then, uh, do well. And uh, that's about uh, time for today.